Hello and welcome to The Beat, a news and talk program brought to you by the Center for Community Media at Worcester State University. I'm your host, Iman Dasiyama, and today we will be interviewing John Lynch, screenwriter and professor. So can you tell our viewers about your background and how you became a screenwriter? Yes, uh, yes. thank you for uh, having me here. This is great to be back to my campus. Uh, I was here in uh, 1990, uh, I don't want to say my age, but um, uh, I can say that here, when I was a freshman, um, I took some communication classes, I took some English classes, I took some philosophy classes, so I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I know that I love to go to the movies, and I, when I was 11 years old, I was in a newspaper for choosing um, the Academy Awards. I was the only one that got them all right, so they made a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent a lot of time in the movies. Um, used to get grounded for going to the movies too often when I was young. So when I got here, I took an understanding movies class and started looking at the details of film and um, the scene and the sound. But I always loved the dialogue. I loved to write short stories and have most of them uh, conversations. So I thought uh, I was going to go to Amherst for graduate school and get a uh, master's and possibly a PhD in English. Um, and so I uh, was sort of assigned to that, but I decided to apply to Emerson College just because of their MFA in screenwriting program, and by then I started writing visual uh, plays and um, some visual scenes for short films and things like that. And I was accepted to Emerson, and they had an uh, LA program, which they still do, where you get internships in the business while getting school credit. So I decided to go do that. And I don't know if you ever become a professional screenwriter. I think you're always learning. But um, I, my master's thesis was optioned by my professor at Emerson, whose uh, business partner also had a production company. So I was defending my thesis. And then I ended up signing a contract in what we call an option, where somebody um, pays you so you won't shop the script around while they can try to get it made. So um, right away, I was thrown into the business aspect of that. Um, one thing led to another, and I started writing for television more, and got a job on that 70s show uh, through the showrunner of Third Rock from the Sun, um, and spent a season and a half in the writer's room at, uh, on the 70s show, and that was an experience. Um, but I always loved film more than TV, and so I um, pursued the screenplays after that job ended. Um, and so ever since I've been teaching screenwriting and um, rewriting scripts and working with people and um, the rest is uh, history as they say. Great, great. What's it like to work as a professional screenwriter? Um, again, this is, these are great questions. Uh, to work as a professional screenwriter uh, is fantastic. Um, what you have to prepare for is there's a lot of time you're not working as a screenwriter. And that aspect of it, you really need incentive to write things what we call on spec, where you're writing it and you have no idea whether it's going to be sold or whether you're sitting in a room for six months with your cats and it's just another good story that's going to end up on your computer. right? Um, so I think just like any other writing, uh, creative writing, uh, profession, I want to say, or creative writing, uh, passion is more like it. You really need to um, remember that you're doing it because you love it. It has to be a love, it has to be a passion, because a lot of times um, you're not working as a professional writer. But when you do get optioned and when you do get hired to rewrite somebody else's script and you're getting paid to do this kind of work, there's nothing like it. And, uh, you know, uh, the experience on the TV show, I mean, you get to hear people say your words on camera. I mean, it's, it's quite uh, magical, but even more when you are doing something you really love to do and you're getting paid for it, right? Exactly. So. Great. What are some of the projects that you've worked on so far, and what was your favorite project? My favorite project? Um, I think my favorite project, uh, and as I said before, I, I've worked on uh, some TV shows and options and rewrites of some films. Um, 
Well, my favorite project was a, my Emerson film that uh, was my first time grabbing a camera and doing everything, writing, directing. Um, I acted in it. Um, I think one of the reasons why I became a screenwriter early on is I knew I, I wasn't going to be an actor. Um, I just knew. Um, so, uh, but in this particular case, the actor bailed out at the last uh, minute, and so I stepped in. <laughs> um, but it was so fun to walk, go around Los Angeles and capture these moments of film and have people, uh, really great actors, volunteer their time to be in your movie because they like the script and uh, shooting in restaurants and shooting in, you know, uh, at the LAX airport and the traffic, and it was just so fun to, to do that, uh, and it was fresh and everything. And, we were doing, everyone was doing it because it was a passion project. There wasn't a lot of money to be made, but uh, we, you know, got to film into some festivals and we had Q&As and it was just a great experience I had. What steps should a person take in order to become a professional screenwriter? Uh, there's a famous quote by William Goldman who wrote a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade and, and he says, the first rule about screenwriting um, is uh, there are no rules. So. <laughs> Um, the steps to become a screenwriter, uh, you could ask 10 different screenwriters that and you get 10 different answers. Um, obviously, if you have a passion and love for film and writing film, um, then the goal is to immerse yourself into that society. Uh, whatever you're passionate about, um, you need to uh, really emaciate yourself into this, this uh, group of people that you're with. If you want to be a newscaster, you need to jump in with other newscasters and learn from them and, and be in this society and help each other. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and where do you get that? Where I got that was from Emerson at first, because there were 10 of us in the grad program who were going out to LA. I drove cross country with somebody who I just hardly even knew. And um, we all were uh, doing the same thing for the same reason. And to this day, I'm in touch with a couple of these uh, uh, fellow students. and. Uh, you know, one thing, I know somebody who's looking for this, I know somebody's looking for that, one thing led to another, and, and things can happen like that. So to really uh, immerse yourself into uh, the world of screenwriting is a good step, but the best uh, advice I can give to screenwriters is to sit at the computer and write, um, mm -hmm. and rewrite, and write again, and outline, and get to know who you're writing about, and characters, and visual language, and how in screenwriting, you can't say John looks out the window and thinks of Kansas. That's not screenwriting because uh, on screen, you can't see thinks of Kansas, right? right? John looks out the window and uh, suddenly interface, there is a memory of uh, a windmill and uh, some wheat fields or whatever the case is. So um, the idea of learning the craft uh, is extremely important. What I see is that a lot of people want to be writers, but not a lot of people like to write. There's a difference. Right? I can say I'm a writer, um, and if I say I'm a writer, that means I sit in a room by myself and go over things and go over scenes over and over again. And um, so that's the less romantic part. So if you want to be a professional writer, you have to learn from the professionals, and you have to uh, learn from your own mistakes on what you're doing, what you can do better, and uh, always be willing to, um, to grow as a, and do the grunt work as a writer. Great. Can you talk a little bit about the creative process? Is it ever difficult to create or find new project ideas? <laughs> I feel like I'm one question ahead of you now. I, just, I think I just uh, uh, explained some of the process. Um, the creative process, like anything else, is different for everybody. Uh, you know, there's some, I uh, worked with three or four writing partners where we would write a script together. Um, that way you can see if it's working and you can sort of, if you have a good writing partner, you sort of complement each other's strengths and, and uh, sort of cover up for each other's weaknesses. And uh, I had a writing partner and she liked to write um, in Starbucks and she needed people around. She couldn't sit in a room. She, and when she, we were in a room, she needed a radio on. And, and I need quiet and kind of uh, just minimal white noise in the background. Um, but the creative process for visual storytelling is you have to see the, the scene in your imagination and you have to accurately portray that on the computer. 
Or right. if you're somebody like Woody Allen Longhand, he writes all his films Longhand. Um, I don't. So the process is to try to get this picture in your mind out onto uh, a piece of paper and mm -hmm. somebody else to read it mm -hmm. and get what you're trying to do. Right. So one of the most difficult things to do as any kind of writer. Um, so that process is different for everybody. My process is I like to write early in the morning before anyone gets up uh, and it's quiet and the sun's coming up and I'll write for two hours and go back to bed for an hour and then i uh, get up and start my day probably doing schoolwork and things like that and then I write for about an hour and a half at night. So I do about three and a half hours every day, Monday through Friday I write and that's just my process mm -hmm. um, and I, I've been doing that for years. Um, even when I'm traveling, uh, I do it, um, and I set the, the clock, and, uh, but other people have different methods, mm -hmm. um, and whatever works, and that's another thing, you have to be sort of flexible about what you're going to try, what you're not going to try, what works and what doesn't. So. Right. When you teach screenwriting at the university level, what do you encourage students to focus on? <sighs> I think the major... Um, component of beginning screenwriting, or starting to screenwrite, is the absolute necessity for pre-writing. Um, you know, we all, and I don't, I don't know if we all, but I get calls from people who say, I have a great idea for a movie, okay? Okay. I have family members, I have people I grew up with always calling me and say, I have a great idea for a movie. And it is a great idea for a scene of a movie, yeah. right? But we always have this thing uh, in the circles that I'm in where we say, how is it on page 50, right? Where you have a great idea for a movie and a screenplay is 120 pages long. First act is usually a half hour and then we have uh, 60 pages or so for the second act um, and then we have uh, about 25 pages for the uh, climax. So there's like three acts in, in that stage. Um, if you have a great idea for a movie and you haven't pre- uh, outlined and pre-thought about B stories and what's the movie going to be about an hour into it, you end up on page 50 and you're done. You've told the whole story. Mm -hmm. So then you realize that you have to go back and create more story, more plot, more movie. Okay. And a lot of times that means sacrificing what you wrote already. So uh, um, you can spend a long time writing a, a good idea that ends up being just that couple of good scenes. So pre-writing is essential. Attention to detail. Remember, you have to stand out to the people who are saying, we're interested in you, we're going to option you, or we're going to make this film. Um, how do you stand out from the millions, maybe, of people who have screenplays somewhere on their computer? Um, you need to be an attraction on the page to actors, directors, producers who can get the film made. Mm -hmm. And in that aspect, you really have to um, once again, immerse yourself in the process of pre-writing beat sheets, getting into the visuals, rewriting, taking notes, and learning when to use your notes and when not to use your notes. For characters, I cut out pictures or I print out pictures from uh, the internet and put them around my uh, computer so when I'm putting dialogue in somebody's mouth, I can look at their picture and say, would she say that, would he say that? Um, that's just my process. So. Um, Anything that gets you in the chair and keeps you there is yeah. a good process. Okay. And recently, a former student of yours wrote a script that turned into the documentary 508 Bike Life. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? That was um, exciting as far as um, what they were able to do um, with such little time and with no permits. They were uh, a group in the city was um, felt like they were being neglected about bike lanes and bike paths and parks that they could uh, ride their bikes in, in around the city. And um, they got together and they filmed this kind of, um, I would say, reaction to this lack of respect. And um, they, I thought it was only going to be the script. It was a documentary writing class, uh, but they actually went out and shot it and uh, it was well done. Um, I have personally recommended it to a couple uh, documentary film festivals, um, and uh, the end result of that is that they have a bike park in Worcester now, 
and they've agreed to expand bike lanes and, and all new construction. And it's, um, it's not solely from this group that made this film, but this film resonated with the people who said, you know, if you want bikes out of traffic, you have to give them somewhere to go. Right. Um, and then the, on the other side, the uh, people driving the bikes have to realize that if they build you something, you have to use it and not just still dance around in traffic. So I haven't got an update recently, but I know that the, uh, the people who were involved in it um, were extremely happy that uh, I was able to recommend them to some festivals and that Worcester is doing something about that problem. That's so. amazing. Why should a student enroll in a course focused on writing or film or TV? Well, I think it's um, uh, essential to learn um, about what it takes to write in a visual medium. Um, and what the background is in, in these television sitcoms, screenplays, um, in plays, or any kind where you're putting words into characters' mouth, uh, mouths. So in that, I think um, students discover more than just what goes into writing a movie. They go, they, it goes into a lot of what they want to say. Um, whenever a uh, student takes my class and, and says, I can't find a story, I say, well, what do you want to say about life? What do you want to say about the world? What's your view of the world? You will find a story to match what's going on inside of you. Um, so uh, in that aspect, I think it's not just to come in and write a screenplay and win an Academy Award. It's to find out what kind of world do you want to create visually and knowing that this world could be created someday into a, a film is incentive enough for them to do it. So um, I do want to talk about a, a documentary that we just got financing for that's uh, important to me is um, there's 75,000 homeless people in Los Angeles. Uh, there's um, tent cities around City Hall. They had a typhus outbreak from uh, the rats and the, and the um, uh, the atmosphere there in City Hall itself. Um, and what this music producer I know did who called me was he went down there to see if he could make a difference. He started playing free concerts for the people to try to get them inside and try to talk to them. And he found five musicians that um, were living in tents, they were homeless, and he agreed to pay for their CD. Um, to pre-produce it, to produce it, to do the sound, to market it, and he uh, let them stay at his studio in North Hollywood, California, and he um, let them uh, pick out the tunes, the original songs they wanted to do, uh, let them practice, guided them, and they cut this CD that is uh, really gaining a lot of critical reception. So you have these guys who were living in tents one day and in this this sort of professional huge music studio the next day and they're so talented so what Billy wanted to do is write a documentary he wanted me to write it and he wanted to shoot it and um, shooting begins uh, probably at the end of the month and there's already something on YouTube a little promo of the band itself and the mayor of Los Angeles now wants to meet with the band and Rodin so we'll see when um, when politics comes into this and they want to represent themselves in film, how they represent themselves. But the money Billy got from the film is not from anybody who wants Billy to depict this in any certain way. So um, the sad thing about this is, yes, these are, are professional musicians who really uh, work hard and, and got this CD made, but they decided to go back to the tents. So after the music stops, it's not like a happy ending where you know these people are rescued. Right. They go back to the, among the seventy-five thousand people living on the streets, and it's getting, it's increasing. It's more. So um, hopefully, we'll expose some of what's going on. We'll put some faces on some of these people who are um, living in the streets and dying in the streets. And but these in incredibly talented musicians. And these, this is a small sample of the talented people who are now living on the streets of this country because they either can't afford it, uh, a, a variety of circumstances, uh, housing closing down, um, addiction, mental illness, or lack of funding for help and all this. So I'm, I'm really passionate that uh, we're able to make 
this particular uh, statement and get this out there because film is, uh, film can change people's lives. Uh, film can save people's lives if uh, presented in the right context. So looking forward to that. Well, thank you for shedding light on that and it was a pleasure having you here with us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for watching this segment of The Beat. Please remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We'll see you next time.